Hello, I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski, and this is What Wise Women Want, here on Charlottesville's Public Access Comcast Channel 13. Every week we bring you panels of women to discuss topics that might be of interest to you. Ladies, we're 52% of the population with 85% of the purchasing power. Let's use that power by making ourselves informed about the kinds of things that we'd like to do to enhance our lives, our families, our children, and our community. If you'd like more information on the topics we talk about every week, if you'd like to send us a question for future topics, they're all listed on our website, www.whatwisewomenwant.com, and wise is spelled with a Z. And there you can f fill out the information and ask us questions. You can also find all of our panelists that have ever been on the program. Each woman has a page, and on that page you will find contact information or more background information, because many of the women have very extensive backgrounds, and we really can't talk about it here on the program. Tonight we're going to be talking about the essentials of what are the essential elements of creativity and intelligence. Apparently it's a very hot topic because the minute we decided on this conversation, it came up in Scientific America. So creativity is the new buzzword, but we're going to be talking about it from several different perspectives, from the perspectives of working with children as well as adults in the marketplace. On our panel tonight, to my right, is Michelle James, who is the CEO of the Center for Creative Emergence, and that's for adults. To her right is Nicole Root, who is founder of Explorations Play Studio. To her right is Sharifa Oppenheimer, who's author and co-founder of the Charlottesville Crossroads Waldorf School. And to her right is Lisa Stussel, an author and also teacher in the Charlottesville Waldorf School. Okay, ladies, creativity is what you all do for a living. So why don't we, t I think people have uh, many different ideas about what they think creativity is. So I'd like to start off by talking about what it is that you say creativity is. Sharifa, do you have an idea of how we can define creativity for our talk tonight? Well, because I work with young children, I feel like the foundation of creativity is um, really in the heart of childhood, which is play. So from my perspective, I feel like creativity is born out of play. And, um, and I think that, that the necessity for play not only is, is essential for children, but throughout a whole lifetime. And I think that Michelle can um, also talk about a creativity for the adult and what this continuum is that begins with play and ends up in your realm. So in, in terms of creativity then, um, you know, there's all kinds of creativity. And I was thinking about the topic that's on the market right, that's in the news right now, uh, the invasion of the target market. And, you know, the 140 million um, people who have had their uh, their credit card information stolen. Well, that's got to be a really creative people who are thinking of that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we have all kinds of definite people think about, you know, being in front of the computer playing computer games is creative. And, I, you know, I had, I had a client this week who thought their children were creative because they were working on this computer game that built things, you know, in airspace. So, Lisa, is that what creativity looks like? You know, I think that's a facet of it, and I, I think that we need to, to give permission for all of these various um, facets and features of creativity. It's not just uh, cut and dried. And I think that the more that our culture evolves and develops, you're going to see more and more manifestations of it. The video games, certainly if they're building, they're creating, there's you know all kinds of creativity going on. And, in high technology and with the use of computers, but you know you can also dial back and really just start again with young children and see what they do in the mud. You know, you can go from the the very basics of what is found in nature all the way up to the highest of high technology and find creativity imbued in all of these activities. Nicole, what kinds of things do you 
in gender and creativity in the definition? I really love to think of creativity as a way to be fully self-expressed. So you're removing other people's agenda from the children, from other adults, from seniors, whomever, and allowing them to come to the table, the floor, whatever, with their materials and build and create from within. So no rules or expectation. It is just this more un, a, a more unfolding natural process. Michelle, you work with adults. Um, how do you see creativity with adults? How do you define that for adults? Well, I would say um, what everyone else said, uh, uh, I liked what you said about it being larger than one particular definition, but I would particularly say around birthing something new into the world um, from the inside out and then also with adult, you know, from the outside in through engaging the world around them, but also connecting to that creative source within themselves, that, that source of creativity. So I think it's something new emerging and being birthed into the world, whether it's um, actively engaged or it just unfolds. So do, do, do you, in your estimation, do children play today, really? Mm. <laughs> really? Well, they certainly do in my classroom, and I'm, I'm sure they do in your classrooms as well. Um, as a matter of fact, in the Waldorf Early Childhood Classroom, the highest priority that we have for the children is to give them the, the time, the patience, the space, and just the very fundamental raw materials to play. We really see play as paramount for young children not only to occupy their time and to make them happy, but really to promote brain development. And I know that Sharifa can talk a little bit more about that as well, but yeah, they are playing uh, just with tremendous vitality and creativity and joy. Um, it's really a phenomenon. It's, it's wonderful to see. And, and of course, the sad thing is that there are so many schools now that are canceling play for children because they don't have the time. What, what do you mean by that, canceling that They're play? taking it out of the schedule because they feel that they need to spend all of that school time preparing for tests, which is really tragic, tragic really in the classical sense of the word. So, you know, in terms of play, um, she said something, uh, Lisa said something about you, um, you know, what does it look like? We've been taught, we've been saying play, but what is, you know, people have this concept of what it is, but what does it look like, really? Because in my mind, it's, it's kind of chaotic. You know, it's not necessarily organized and structured and all that kind of thing. Organized right? chaos. So. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. So, so what, what, what does play look like? I think it looks like the litter of the forest floor. The litter of the forest floor. Yes, because it's very organic. It's not, with young children, it's not particularly orderly. Um, and the children can, um, well, one of the sort of principal ideas that we work with in the, in the Waldorf School um, is that anything can be anything in terms of play. So the play materials are very open-ended, um, and many of the materials are taken from nature or made of natural materials. So it might be that there are simple dolls made of natural materials, um, seashells, um, little wooden boats, just very simple, kind of like the traditional toys and then the children can take those toys and rather than the toy playing itself rather than the instructions coming out of the toy to the child um, rather than it being battery operated that the child can just take whatever the toy is and make it into anything one of the things um, that for years i had in my classroom was a basket of um, corn cobs now we had already taken the corn off the cobs and given it to the squirrels, so it was just a basket of corn cobs. And 
you would not believe. I wish that I had written down over the years all the different things that a corn cob can be. <laughs> you know, it can be rollers for the beauty parlor. Um, it can be uh, a flashlight, you know. It can be a little submarine going under, under the water. Um, there are just so many different uses for a corn cob or a seashell, the same kind of thing. So really, it's this sense that um, anything can be anything, that the child's imagination can, can really um, take ascendancy. And they look around the room and they think, well, we're playing this and we need something. What could that be? And then they just look around the room and pick up what, you know, what, what is the right toy to be whatever their imagination calls for. And that, like I said, the litter of the forest floor, um, it's very earthy and it's very organic and it's not very well organized, but it is so creative and it's so rich and what grows up, you know, is um, just tr tremendous um, beauty in the lives of the child and, and in the developing mind. One of the things that I hear uh, constantly from, uh, I work with business people all the time, is that people lack creativity in the workplace. And uh, imagination and the ability to, you know, think in outside the box, as, as we say, and things like that. So, you know, you are all talking about the kinds of creativity and play that seems to be, I mean, it feels like it's becoming the dinosaur of a child's, you know, mm -hmm. it's a lost art in childhood these days. There's no, you know, the, the, the toy market is being bombarded, you know, they're being bombarded with all, and they have to have the news, new and the latest, and the thing that talks, and Not the things that Not even toys that anymore, it's phones. Phones, yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. For babies. Exactly. Yeah. Phones for babies? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Apps, yeah. apps on your iPhone for mm -hmm. babies. Yeah, yeah. So right. we forget about the, the toys. Who needs a toy when you've got a phone? Well, and that's what, what we feel. One of our main purposes at Explorations Play Studio is to educate parents that there mm -hmm. are other options. Like we refer to our toys as materials, and there's a difference. It's they engage with them like they would be with their toys, but because they're open-ended and the forest floor, you know, very similar, we're interior, you know, we're inside, but a lot of natural materials and, you know, one day that you know, corn is gonna be one thing and the next day another thing. And so the child comes to the materials with their agenda versus the toy having its own agenda and imposing it on the child. And open-ended materials have that chance of capturing the child's attention for a longer period of time because children just innately are wired to explore and discover and they're creating all these different you know, neurological pathways and so they're gonna be craving new things all the time. But if there's so many different ways to use something, mm -hmm. There's longevity in what they're working with, rather than you know some little toy is going to do a couple things, and you know and what parents always say, oh yeah, they're more interested in the box. Exactly. Well, because they can do a lot more with the box. Yeah. I think that's the same. The same is actually true for adults. The difference in working with adults is because they've been socialized and educated, and sometimes traumatized out of. Uh, their inherent natural creativity. One of the things I will say to them is, you have nature on your side, just really about reconnecting to it. Um, the, I think the big difference with adults is sometimes um, I find it helpful to introduce them to principles of engagement. What kids might naturally know, you know, to build on each other's ideas, to play, to start exploring, adults often might need to be reminded of it or have permission because they'll go immediately to evaluation, evaluating themselves, evaluating others, deflecting with sarcastic comments. So when you set a safe container for adults through principles that, of engagement and, you know, that they all agree on, then, and then you give them different things to interact with, with their whole brain, and they can create new neurological pathways. But first they need to feel safe, emotionally uh, safe, that they're not gonna be shamed. And then, then they can start to access that same thing. And um, it's really amazing when you can see almost that inner child, that childlike spark come back with an adult in the workplace to uh, inform their work. 
and life. What, what, to explain a little bit about principles, what, what do you mean um, by that? Okay, so uh, there are many principles of engagement. So for example, and this would be borrowed from improv theater, because I do a lot of work with applied improvisation. Well, improv theater, a lot of the principles that allow you to just co-create something new out of nothing are really just natural principles of creativity. For example, the yes and. Uh, well, kids naturally often build on it. You know, they'll, someone will throw out an idea and then somebody else is like, oh yeah, and they add on and they co-create. Well, adults are so socialized to a stop, judge, and evaluate. Was your block good? Where you put that? And does this work? And so in the yes and, you can't stop and evaluate. You have to accept the reality someone else gave you and then add something new. And that helps keep it be generative and co-creative. And, 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 you know, the, the kinds of, sp of uh, spaces that you three create for children encourage that kind of, naturally mm -hmm. encourage that kind of exploration. Um, you had started to talk about, uh, Sharif, you said, started to talk about, and actually Nicole did too, entertainment versus um, play. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about that because I think we're so enculturated, or at least if you want to chime in as well, children are so programmed now to be entertained instead of being participatory. It's m much more, you know, observational than it is participatory mm -hmm. anymore like it was when we were younger. Well, and it's not only just the children, it's the parents. It's their mm -hmm. thinking that their children have to be entertained all the time and so thinking that they need the bells and whistles and when you pull all that out of the picture the children are actually a lot more relaxed and natural and maybe we're making assumptions of what children want when they really don't. Mm -hmm. what, what occurs to me is um, it doesn't happen very often in, in my classroom but I'm thinking with my own children, my sons, when they got to a certain age, and it was probably not until they were nine or ten, um, they figured, well, that they would try being bored. <laughs> I'm bored. You know, they, they grew up in the Waldorf system, so they had loads of opportunity for creativity and for play. And, um, but they decided, what would it be like if they said, well, I'm bored. So they would come to me, and they would say, we're bored. And I would say, well, that's a good sign. That's, That's a good. great sign because that means there's a little empty place inside of you that's waiting for a great idea to come along. Mm. So go off and tell me, come back and tell me what that great idea was. And they would do it. <laughs> they would just go somewhere, they'd go to their room, you know, and sit around and puzzle about it. And then they would come back with a great idea. And I think that is if, if I or if parents these days, if the child says, I'm bored, then the parent feels like I have a responsibility to keep my child engaged, and now they're not engaged, and I've failed, and so now I have to offer something. Right. Whereas what actually needs to happen is that something needs to emerge mm -hmm. from inside. Mm -hmm. And that's where the life force is. That's where the juice is. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I liked um, also what you said earlier about that, that, the, that the parents really need to be educated in this way. You know, and that's, that's... Well, and because their comfort level of saying, you know, when my nine-year-old comes to me and says, I'm bored because I've said no friends, no screen time, you know, I'm like, that's okay. I'm like, great, awesome. Mm -hmm. And I know as an adult that she will work through that. It might be tough for a little bit, but once she gets over that, then amazing things come out of it. But if I don't give her that time, then exactly. we're just kind of stuck in the, yeah. the same old ride. Yeah. And, and then it, 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 it's a repeating cycle. Right. I want more, I want more. Right. There are authors, that, and I'm thinking Kim John Payne is one of them, mm. who's talked about the gift of boredom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that we really need to give our children as parents that gift because you know, just think about what it is that spark of resourcefulness that is developed out of boredom. And if you never give the child that opportunity to find that moment within them where they can generate the joy and the, the fun and the new, new ideas, then you're robbing them of an of a incredible and really um, tremendously important capacity that 
will serve them for their whole lives. And I'm sure you can speak to that. Yeah, I think that's so absolutely true, especially with adults, because as parents, they don't know. They, they're so socialized to fill the space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whatever we do, and if we don't fill it from something we're engaged in, we'll fill it with something we watch or something we go to mm -hmm. rather than allowing that emergent space. Mm -hmm. And so working with adults, that is, you have to actually say, okay, we're gonna now take this space, and it w might be uncomfortable, and just allowing people know, know that there might be some discomfort. When you get to the edge of what you know, and you get to the edge of your distraction, and just being able to hold, you know, and then and really being present to what emerges. Mm -hmm. What are the impulses? That's where you learn to hear that inner voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, if you can do that as a parent, then it's easier for you to create that space for your kids to do that. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people just don't know because it's, there's a, a leap. Like there's a little bit of leap from before the new idea emerges or before the impulse emerges. You've now reached the edge of what you know and, mm -hmm. and it's, so it's very uncomfortable. There's a resistance there. There's, anyone just wants to fill the space. But if you could hold that space for a little longer, even, even with just being uncomfortable with it, or just start engaging something with a, a non-habitual part of your brain, start drawing something out that your left brain doesn't consciously know, then all of a sudden something new has a, a, a channel to show up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often, with uh, clients, if I'm doing a group workshop and things like that and I find that they're really stuck, I'll remove all the chairs out of the room and just have people move and mm -hmm. just in that little bitty time of having people move out of them out of their heads out of their space you know all of a sudden things begin to spark mm -hmm. for them yeah. uh, and we're so in, enculturated in sitting in chairs and being entertained in front of a screen of one kind or another or i think even at the stage of parents now don't have the capacity to know what, you know, it, it con as you said, constantly being, having to entertain them all the time or to do something. Or I see so many children in therapy who are so stressed out because they are scheduled to yes. death. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we don't want them to get into trouble. So right. we have them do, they're in this sport and they're doing that yeah. and they're after school mm -hmm. activities. And, and I'm like, when are they ever, they have bags, the children have bags under their eyes, they have ticks and body problems and I'm, when are they ever going to relax and just talk about assimilating through play. Yes. I know Sharifa you know a little bit about that assimilating right. you know working through your problems through play. Right, as a ch right. and, and in, in um, our classrooms what we can see is in the children's lives whatever really whatever it is that's going on in the child's life comes into the classroom and with these very open-ended materials, the children have an opportunity to, um, to play through whatever, whatever the event is. And it might be something, um, maybe a grandparent has died, and, so, and they've been you know, to the, the funeral and so forth and come back now. And then they have this opportunity. What, is it, what does it even mean? To die and where where has grandma gone and then you know the the games begin you know of the funerals and you know and then and then popping back to life you know jumping back now I'm alive again and you know that the child has the opportunity to kind of find their way it. through or if there's a new um, sibling that that is in the life or even you know if it's just been a rough day the day before then that can even show up in the play. And what this does is it gives the child an opportunity to, um, to play out these different scenarios yes. and to try, diff they can play the different parts and try the different, um, different scenarios on and see what the outcomes are and change the outcomes. So I think that for a child to be so completely overscheduled um, and to not have the opportunity to just, and the quiet time, you know, it takes some quiet time to, to be able to play and to not be able to, to assimilate what's going on in their life. I think it's like tremendous indigestion. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Good. <laughs> That's a good yeah, metaphor. Um, t one of the things that I see so little of, um, especially in you know the younger children's classrooms, is I remembered you know being able to wear different dresses and clothes and things. I mean, we pay actors and actresses millions of dollars to play all kinds of roles, and yet we don't allow children the opportunity to express themselves and to play different scenarios. When I worked in a uh, very sort of dangerous place in Philadelphia in a school there, it was difficult. Uh, the children had a lot of behavior problems because of the things that were going on at home. But w when they came into school and you allowed them to play, if I listened to what was going on, I would find out why it was that they were the behavior problem. And you know, when someone acted out that mother had stabbed father, you know, before breakfast, <sighs> and then we wonder why their behavior problem in school. But we don't have the opportunity in our schools today. We're so bogged down with all the intellectual pursuits mm -hmm. that we just don't give children the opportunity to act out in a, in an, a healthy way is what we're saying here. In a here. safe space. Exactly. Well, and it and doesn't even have to be that. that extreme. It doesn't have to no. be a death. I mean, one of the most popular things in the studio is for children to act out birthdays because they're surrounded by that all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll choose, um, you know, we choose our materials very carefully, especially when we put them on our play tray. And, um, you know, we have kind of an idea in our mind what we're trying to create and seeing what they do with it. But it does not matter what it is. If they want birthday candles and a birthday cake, they're going to have a birthday cake. But, I mean, play is for children. I mean, it's obviously the way they learn, but it's how they make sense of their world. So yes. even if it's acting out how mom's cooking in the mm -hmm. kitchen, you know, it doesn't have to be this yes. big life-altering thing that's happened to them, but they just need to try everything out. Mm -hmm. And they do that through their play. And I would say adults, too. Uh, um, it's becoming increasingly popular now to bring theater-based techniques into the workplace mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. adults can act out because they learn through tinkering, exploring, mm -hmm. trying on different personas. And, um, Aren't and people afraid to solving? do that in the workplace because they're afraid fear of failure? Yeah, well, part? right, and so that's why you, you exactly. spend time warming up and creating a safe space because, exactly. oh, you couldn't just go in and do it because there are layers of armor, right. not just uh, their history and whatever creativity story they're carrying about why they're not creative or what happened when they were five and the teacher told them they couldn't do this or something. They're carrying all the dynamics within their team or within their groups. Mm -hmm. Um, and so a lot of it is first doing things to tr almost trick, trick their habitual mm -hmm. mind um, that are fun, low risk, low, um, no stakes. You know, there's no way to look bad. You know, one of, the, one of the principles of improv, which I love, which is another principle that when you in introduce it to adults, they immediately feel safer, is make everyone else look good. And so it's so mm -hmm. opposite the way we're socialized yeah, where you yeah, stand up. Yeah. So. Mm. Yeah, that's part, part of it is creating the safe container, warming them up before you get into the real issues that they need to work out. You know, you all, you have used this word constantly throughout this conversation, and that's safety and security. And I wonder how many children, in young children, even adults, of course I see this all the time in therapy, don't feel safe. They have no safe space. I had a 40-year-old woman in my practice, and we, there was an experience where she finally felt safe, and she said, I am 40 years old, and I had no idea. I never knew what safe felt mm -hmm. like before, mm -hmm. or security. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what is it about you know, our culture that our, our children are not feeling? I mean, I can, I'm sure we're talking about the television and all the things we're bombarded with in television, but Lisa, what? What is it that we're not feeling safe about? I mean, why isn't that children aren't feeling safe and secure? Well, I'm going to take a little piece of that question, Daria, and that's specifically about why our children aren't feeling safe, safe and secure. And I think that one of the things that I see a lot in my work with preschool children and their families is that parents with all of the best intentions make the mistake of talking to their children as though they were small adults. Yep. Dressing them like adults. Dressing them like adults, yep. exposing them to things that yep. adults, yep. Yep. you know, are exposed yep. to. Yep. And um, part of this is actually just the act of 
talking to them too much, which, which makes them operate on a cognitive level that emotionally they're not prepared to deal with. And when you awaken this intellectual capacity, before a child is emotionally, developmentally ready, there's a gap between the cognitive development and the emotional development. And into that gap comes fear. Because they have an awareness of being separate. And who's taking care of me? And that's, it's, it's really tremendously frightening for young children. And so, as I said, it's with the best of intentions. And I know that I did it. And it, actually, Sharifa was my child's first <laughs> teacher. And she was the one who told me, you know, you might try talking less. And I was thinking, well, what do you mean I want my child to be intelligent and witty and bright and all of those things? And, and I have, you know, over the, the years, realized over and over how much disservice we do to our children by talking to them as though they were little adults. And, and Let assuming, them be children. Yeah, and assuming that they understand the kinds of things right. at the level we're talking about. Right. You are watching What Wise Women Want here on Charlottesville's Public Access Comcast Channel 13. I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski. And today our panel is talking about the essential elements of creativity and intelligence, all the way from children to the adult years. On our panel today, to my right, is Michelle James, who's founder of um, the, and CEO of the Center for Creative Emergence. To her right is Nicole Root, who's founder of Explorations Play Studio. To her right is Sharifa Oppenheimer, author and co-founder of the Charlottesville Waldorf School. And to her right is Lisa Stussel, author and teacher of the Charlottesville Waldorf School. That was absolutely perfect in terms of, you know, the, the kinds of things that, and so simply and, and honestly explained to us in terms of every, I see this all the time where mm -hmm. parents are assumed that a four-year-old, five-year-old understands the kind of adult language and mm -hmm. even the movies that they're watching mm -hmm. or the books that mm -hmm. they're reading to them or the expectation of the kinds of activities that they should be doing. When, I mean, they're just not allowed to be, I keep saying the art of childhood seems to be, you know, yeah. have gone by the wayside. Mm -hmm. What about, um, a child's brain development. You know, what, what happens in play in terms of the, we sort of alluded, we've been alluding to this mm -hmm. in our conversation, and, and adults as well. What happens to, um, I know you wanted to talk about the somasomatic um, parts of the brain, yes, in, in terms of the creative process, and what about the brain? How does the brain work in play? I could I could say something about that at the at the child's level and it probably has great correlation also at the adult level. And um, one of the principles that I think is not very well understood is that um, all the different parts of the brain in in a developing brain in the child are wired together so that they are in communication through through movement, through physical movement. And it's that kind of physical movement that the child experiences in play, and not necessarily just in active play, like an outdoor kind of play, but also indoor, the, the kind of um, finer motor coordination that's involved in indoor play. All of that movement really wires all the different parts of the brain together. The child is is engaged constantly in taking in a huge, huge ocean of sensory input. And the way that the sensory input becomes coordinated so that there is meaning, so that what they're experiencing has meaning, is through movement. And when we disallow the child the ability to play in vigorous outdoor activities and also in more fine um, kind of indoor play, we really are not giving them the opportunity for 
all of this um, integration of the brain and and really that the neural pathways are are well it's like a highway that's been well and orderly um, laid out um, and we see this because children are movement deprived because yes. of um, well, for many reasons, um, but certainly because of a deprivation of play, we see this in in um, their brain development, in um, uh, learning disabilities, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, your integration was, uh, I'm assuming, was the um, you know the forebrain, the midbrain, the mm -hmm. um, instinctual brain. There have been a lot, an awful lot of studies, and yet. It seems we do all these scientific studies, especially in my profession, over and over and over again, and yet none of it is put into actual practice. We know all of this, yes. and yet mm -hmm. none of it is put into daily practice, you know, in terms of the way we raise our children. And, and that's what's so sad. You know, we keep, mm -hmm. the, it seems that the marketing experts on the commercials and the billboards and the selling and all of that have, a, have the voice um, in raising our children much more so than practicality or the things that we know, you know, from scientific exploration. There's a lot of profit for them yes. in keeping parents in the dark yes. and actually misleading parents. Yeah. There's an enormous, there's a vast amount of profit in that because if we, um, if we actually were able to educate parents and let them know that less is more and that really to have that moment, the moments of quiet space while the child is waiting for the new idea to come, sort of teetering on the edge, like you say, of what, what, what the child knows, um, their profits would just, would, would absolutely plummet. And so what is marketed to the good parents, the parents who want the best for their children, is that they have to, the children always have to be engaged and entertained and there's this toy and then there's the whole array of toys that are subsidiary to it mm -hmm. and there's the movie mm -hmm. and the clothes and you name it. And so the reason why science doesn't stand a chance so far is um, because of the huge profit and mm -hmm. the huge um, uh, uh, direction that um, the uh, uh, you know industry is going. I do. Uh Go ahead. I was just going to say a little bit about, I do think there is a shift occurring a little bit um, from parents, at least that come into the studio, where they may not know what to do other than provide them with the commercialized toys and everything, but they're beginning to feel overwhelmed. I'm mm -hmm. seeing it over and mm -hmm. over again, and they're like, they're sick of the clutter the toys that entertain them for two minutes and then they're done and they're kind of pulling out their hair and they stick them in front of the TV. It's not what they want to do, but they don't yeah. know what else to do because we don't have those models out everywhere. You know, what we're seeing is mm -hmm. the commercialized side of things. So I think it's just really important to give parents options and make it doable for them too. And I think a big piece of it is um, to help do that, to move from the theory that a lot of people know, because mm. you can read a book and go, here are the 10 ways to be more creative or raise your creative oh, kids. I see that one more to time. The, <laughs> 10 ways, five right, ways. To, be, to the embodiment. Mm -hmm. um, the parents themselves, it, it works so much better if they can experience it yes. within themselves. And they reconnect to that. And they get to experience, because once it's an embodied in your, in your cells, in your body, you, you begin to know it. And the nice thing that you know, they're discovering all over the place around the brain is the neuroplasticity in that. Yeah. We don't, they used to think you learn to a certain point and then you're stuck and, you know, at the certain ages. And now they find, you know, at any age, you're never too young to, you're never too old to move differently and non-habitually, which and creates new neural pathways in the brain and more whole brain integration. You're never too old to, you know, it's simply something writing with your opposite hand. You know, as you begin to use all these non-habitual things, you move differently, you begin to think differently. You break your patterns, you begin to do different things. All of a sudden, then unrelated ideas begin to come. And then as you're working with your kids or working with different people, you have more options. And I think sometimes someone will read it and they'll get it intellectually, but they don't have the embodied experience of mm -hmm. how do I carry this out, mm -hmm. even if the intention is right. 
Because the nice thing is, with the internet and with exposure to social media and all uh, everything else, we all have access to so much information. Too much. <laughs> right, it's too much sometimes. Overwhelm. Uh, overwhelm. Yeah. Uh, and now I think the, the movement is around embodying it and abo the body and moving mm -hmm. the whole somatic intelligence mm -hmm. is an often overlooked yes. way of embodying information. Well, I teach parenting classes and I, I guess I was raised a different way than, you know, this second and third generation of parents that I teach in, in parenting classes. And I'm constantly amazed at how I have to go to the very fundamentals and basics with parents in terms of showing them step by step by step what to do with their children. And it's, yes. just, you know, I'm just amazed at how they, you know, at the second and third generation level from me, di mm -hmm. dis distinct from me, mm -hmm. that, you know, these people have no concept of how to allow their children to do things. Or, and then, you know, I get called in therapeutically because there's fighting, there's arguing, there's no communication, when all of it can be resolved very easily by, you know, removing all the things that are, you know, in their existence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this conversation that we're having, both to undo, you know, the kinds of things that people have been enculturated with and to create it in children initially, um, hopefully more and more people will seek out, you know, rather than going to the local toy store, um, seek out the kinds of activities and not, and I think one of the other things you were talking about, talking to your children. Um, one of the things that I see constantly also is that the, the parents think they have to constantly entertain them mm -hmm. by talking to them, by paying attention to them, by being with them at all costs and have no concept of how even allowing your child to be in the kitchen with you but at the level you know at their level having pots and pans mm -hmm. you know instead of having everything locked and everything cleaned and everything you know we've got all these sterile environments where there's no exploration allowed i can remember my kids being head to toe in mud you know yeah. so um what kinds of activities can you you know, we'll go from the child level to the adult level. Can you help parents with the kinds of activities that they may or may not think about with for their children in terms of enhancing their creativity? And again, we're talking about creativity, you know, so that we can move out of these out-of-the-box kinds of thinking and, that you know, ex exploration, imagination, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Lisa? Yeah. Um Getting down to the very, very basics, and I think you know the forest floor is a great place to start. <laughs> there are actually there's a there's a whole movement now. I think um, in North America, Europe, they're calling them forest kindergartens, oh. where they have these early childhood programs that are entirely outdoors. Oh. So there's no obviously no screens. There's very few, if any, toys. But the children are outside playing and moving all day long. And so in terms of suggestions, go outside. Go outside with your child and, you know, just sit there and look around what's on the ground. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are you smelling? You know, just take in all of those senses and um, see what's out there. And nine times out of ten, the child will find something to engage their interest, to engage their curiosity, and usually there's just, you know, the one little thing will spark the next thing will spark the next thing. And same thing inside, you, you painted the perfect picture in the kitchen. Just open the cupboards and let them play with the pots and pans. I mean, it's, it's got to be hardwired. It's got to be universal. Children love to play with pots and pans. <laughs> and you know, you don't have to spend any money on them. You've already and got them. And in the sink. Yeah. yeah. Water, pouring water. <clears throat> Get them in the bathtub with some containers and pouring water. As a matter of fact, when, when my girls were little and they started to, you know, bicker at each other, I knew it was bath time. <laughs> as soon as they got in the water, everything mellowed yeah, out. Yeah. 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 And I think that um, one, another, like an, an, um, an addition to doing the most simple thing is to go through the house and it would be an art to do this, but to go through the house and to just take away 
there are the toys that are um, mechanized, that are computerized, that they play themselves, they interact with the children, to just let those toys go away, to um, declutter the house and to declutter those kinds of toys. If we take away those kinds of toys from the children, then they are kind of set back upon themselves. If they're given the simple toys, if they're given, you know, the bathtub, the, the kitchen cupboards, outdoors and simple toys indoors, um, they can step back inside of themselves and find that, that font of creativity. But with the toys that are, um, you know, lighting and making noise, I think if they're in the environment, that's what the child will be drawn to. Our, our brains, um, our uh, sensory motor brains are designed to um, really be aware of a movement, like peripheral movement. And those toys are all in the peripheral movement mm -hmm. kind of category. And so the simple toys really, um, they, they can't stand up to that in the same way that you were talking about the quiet space mm. that that creativity comes from. Um, the quiet space, how, how can we find the quiet space if there's Noise. all the racket mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. going on? And it's the same way with the simple toys as compared to these, mm -hmm. these other kinds of toys. I want to segue with that because I see children a lot who can't sleep. And one of the things that I notice is that all of those toys that are moving and having all those parts all day long, constantly in motion, the child can't unwind from that mm -hmm. and ends up having to have a fan in the room just to have more noise oh, to know. overcome the noise. Mm -hmm. So I, you're absolutely you know, right on target with all this. There are also, you know, toy the dolls, for example, without faces. I remember the Waldorf yeah. dolls with a, you know, with just eyes, so that the imagination, you know, runs wild. So the doll can be happy or sad or anything in between. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 And one thing, actually, there's two things I would love to add. Um, one is if you observe young children playing, what they naturally do is scoop fill, dump, pour, mix, stir, over and over and over again. So if you give them materials that they can do that with, and that's where our play tray concept came out of at the studio, you can just change out the materials. We love to go to Whole Foods and get inspiration you know, at the bulk section. So, you know, right now we have Israeli couscous and tapioca <laughs> in the bin or flaxseed. And so not only does it feel great, so it's therapeutic, it's soothing, um, also really captures their attention. So that play is focused. We were kind of halfway joking that it's um, a little play is a little bit organized chaos, but not all the time. Yeah. You know, much of the time, very, very focused if they have the appropriate things in front of them. So, you know, by giving them a variety of, of scoops and dishes and changing out, we like to call it the bulk item, keeps them entertained or happy, content, focused for long periods of time and is not difficult. It's not rocket science. It's just something that you need to be cognizant of. And then the other thing is sometimes it's not so much about what they have to play with, but how it's presented. Mm -hmm. So if everything's thrown into a trunk or whatever, mm -hmm. and so they're pulling everything out to find one thing and then you have the clutter, but if you just have one thing here and one thing there, they can they see what their choices are, what they have to work with. When it's time to put things back, they can do it. So, and again, it goes back to the less is more, yeah. but and making it accessible and available to them. And so we don't have to be constantly talking to them. You you were you were using that example for more of an emotional level or giving them too much information, but just. If you listen to parents giving directions and instructions and hovering over their child, it's like, just, you know, yeah. let them breathe, stand back, let the environment guide them, and you won't have to say very much. I mean, that's part of the magic of the studio. They walk in, in and they're just off. No one has told them a thing. Yeah. I'm like, can I take your coat? You know, stay a while. <laughs> 
Well, and one of the other problems with the environment is that parents have been taught th from the commercials that they need to have this sensitized, the uh, you know, sensitized environment. It has to be clean and sterile and orderly and mm -hmm. all of those. I mean, they've been indoctrinated over and over again, and what it actually does is desensitize the child, right. you know, and even give them allergies and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned this cake, this ordered chaos when my kids, my boys were really young. I had a room with a piano and a bunch of musical instruments in it. And one day there were six of them and they were four and five years, well, three and four years old. And the group of them went in there and there was a lot of banging going on initially. And then all of a sudden there was this rhythm that, mm -hmm. there, it was like music. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, but it was like music. They became entrained with each other. So that was my rude awakening with, wow, you know, just leave them alone and who knows what kind of harmony, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. can be created by just allowing them to be. Mm -hmm. So you were going to talk about the adult? Oh, I think that, yeah, I think that's also true with the adults, you know, um, who thrive, you know, getting out in nature and out, and, and out of the space, why retreats are so popular and people have all kinds right, of uh, right. great space. But uh, I find one, there are many ways to do it, and the one I'll focus on is um, around nonverbal activities. Mm. Um, it's amazing what can happen, whether by yourself, whether it's journaling or painting or drawing, even, it's not about being an artist, so it's not about it having to look good. It's about the act of doing something from not your habitual thinking mind, without distractions, um, um, and it could be, or movement, but not a dance you know or something anyone taught you. So you allow yourself to discover. And when adults get into discovery mode, um, not only does, do they feel more alive and present and centered and happy, they are much more effective in their work mode. Um, if you think about who moves society forward, it's the people that have had discoveries mm -hmm. that lead them to be impassioned about something, not someone who taught them exactly mm -hmm. go to A to B or right. how to do it. And, uh, or I living think, someone else's history, right? Learning or, about history of someone else and living in someone else's history. Exactly where, marrying. and so it's giving the space, time, and attention to be able f to yourself as an adult to be able to tinker and explore. And you might not think of yourself as an artist, but pick up a you know a paintbrush, and then eventually you'll discover hidden talents or at least passions you didn't even know existed. And when you're in that passion space, it is like a meditation, mm -hmm. whether it's through movement or any kind of, and when you do it with groups, sometimes I do a nonverbal creativity workshop. When you do it with groups, a field happens and the, or, the chaos does start to mm -hmm. organize. Mm -hmm. And then inevitably at the end, when you begin bring talking to you know, reel it in, it's almost like someone, will go, oh, the magic's gone. Like it's almost like a magical, because it, people were allowed to discover and play without stopping to analyze or evaluate. Mm -hmm. And adults are really mm -hmm. good at analyzing and evaluating. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in addition to that, you know, I, I also see parents, and I, I was thinking of an, something that happened in my own life, um, the fear of failure, you yes. know, the fear of, um, um, being hurt and all those kinds of things enter in and my boys were in a 40-foot tree at the top and were swaying at the top and my mother was standing at the bottom absolutely petrified and I said don't you dare say one word I don't care how afraid you are but if you transmit your fear to my kids they're gonna fall out of that tree so don't you dare let them know how you afraid you are and I think that's what happens a lot parents project all of their you know their own feelings onto mm -hmm. it and so you know children aren't allowed to play and when they get to be adults and there's you know they they're inhibited by their ability to be able to move and create you know there's a principle of risk assessment that's being talked about now too that that ties exactly into what you're saying Daria and and the point is that we need to stop hovering to back mm -hmm. off to allow the children to assess these little risks when they're three and four and five years old. Yes. Because if they don't develop that capacity yes, yes, and develop yes. those skills, then they can't do it as grown-ups either. It just becomes, they, they become so closely circumscribed mm -hmm. in their lives because they haven't figured out how to interact with their environment in a, in a fearless way. So 
it's one of the things that I do in my classroom. They're building constantly and climbing and clamoring over things. And I look and say, well, you know, that he might fall there, but you know, as long as there's not going to be a serious head injury, then we're probably going to be and okay. And a lawsuit. You know, sometimes I'll stand close by, but not like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tough. It's tough as adults. And I think this goes back to the question that you asked, why is it that children do not feel safe? And a lot of the things that we've been talking about contribute to that, and this is one of them. If a child is not allowed early on to make these small risk assessments, um, how can they trust themselves? If the child is constantly entertained and overwhelmed by um, by the media, by screen time, and by these toys that are talking to them, how do they find that quiet moment where they act? How do they know themselves? Safety comes from knowing oneself. When we know ourselves, we know, we know what our limits are, we know what we're capable of, we know what our strengths are, we know when we're pushing the envelope. So. Well, um, you, this has gone by so quickly, it's <laughs> unbelievable, and we could be here for another hour, I know, talking about this, and maybe we should return to the topic. Um, we have been amazed at talking about creativity and intelligence with our panel. Michelle James, the CEO of the Center for Creative Emergence. Uh, Nicole Root, the founder of Explorations Play Studio. Sharifa Oppenheimer, author and co-founder of the Charlottesville Waldorf School. And Lisa Stussel, author and teacher of um, the Charlottesville Waldorf School. And I know you've been amazed at the kinds of things that we've been talking about in terms of creativity, and we could go on for, you know, an, another hour talking. We, we just got wound up, I think. We, we we're finally getting our stride here. <laughs> um, th but uh, I, I just wanted to read to you the, the parallel to our conversation in Scientific America, the serious need for play. Free imaginative play is crucial for normal social, emotional, and cognitive development. It makes us better adjusted, smarter, and less stressed. The summation of the, our entire conversation <laughs> this evening. And I want to thank you ladies so much for spending the time with us and covering this topic. And, you know, there's just a wealth of information here. We just, you know, kind of scratched the surface in terms of helping people to become between the adult, from the adult level to the child level to, and, you know, if, if the parents don't become free themselves, it's very yeah. difficult to raise children who are as well. Yeah. So it's not mm -hmm. just in the workplace, but it's mm -hmm, yeah. for parents as well. So mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much for your input. And please join us again next week uh, for very interesting topics. And thank you to, to our panel tonight for talking about the essentials of creativity and intelligence. Have a good evening. And thank you. That was fast. Way too fast. That was great. <laughs> yeah.